Hello, America. I'm Mark Levin. This is Life, Liberty, and Levin. We have a great guest, Speaker Newt Gingrich. Good to be with you. Sir? Good. It's a pleasure. Whole hour. Yeah. How often do you get that? Not very. Well, I don't need to introduce you. Everybody knows who you are. But I want to talk first before we get into the election, because I think it's a crucial election. There are certain issues I want to talk about, certain candidates I want to talk about, the media and so forth. But before we do, I think a little background is useful. You're a historian, uh, and Donald Trump, I would argue, is one of the most conservative presidents we've had in modern history. Now, he may not be a conservative, you know, based on philosophy, uh, but I think he's a conservative as a result of common sense and his background as a developer and so forth. But also, it's part of a trajectory. Explain this trajectory over the last several decades of conservatism and conservative victories. Well, what had happened was that the Roosevelt era Democrats created the modern system, big bureaucracies, centralized power, a whole set of values compounded by uh, Eisenhower making a huge mistake in appointing Earl Warren and leading to a much more radical court than anybody had imagined. So by the early 1960s, you had a reaction building in the country that said government's too big, our policy against the Soviet Union is too weak, taxes are too high, and frankly, we don't want Washington running our lives. The guy who personified that was Barry Goldwater, and he wrote a little book called Conscience of a Conservative, which came out in paperback, and I was a college student at the time, and it just swept the country. I mean, it really created a whole generation of Goldwater supporters who really saw him sort of personifying uh, a new way of thinking about things. He was very important because he broke the establishment's grip on the Republican Party. He lost badly in the general election to Johnson, uh, who probably was going to win anyway because John F. Kennedy had been assassinated and we weren't going to change presidents twice that quickly. But Goldwater sort of planted the flag and ironically, in defeat, he asked Ronald Reagan to make a nationwide speech in October of 64. And so, uh, in a way, the conservative flag was passed from Barry to Ronnie at that moment. Uh, Reagan's speech was electrifying, and he went on to become governor of California. And I would argue that there's a continuum that starts with Goldwater, goes to Reagan, that in many ways, Nixon and all the traditional Republicans are placeholders, uh, just as later on the Bushes would be placeholders. Uh, because they don't actually understand the long-term trajectory of conservatism. Reagan comes along, ultimately be becomes a very consequential president in three ways. Defeating the Soviet Empire, which is an enormous achievement, uh, one of the great strategic victories of all time because he did it without a war. Um, relaunching the American economy, getting people to feel good about being entrepreneurs, and really focused on American civic culture. In fact, in his farewell address, he says one of his great... Uh, sadnesses was that they had not driven home American history enough. But he was trying to rebuild the sense of being American. Uh, you then have a period that, that we're in the doldrums uh, and we come along with the contract with America and for the first time in 40 years the Republicans win the House. Uh, we impose uh, a balanced budget for four straight years. We impose welfare reform. We have a number of other reforms. Bill Clinton actually comes to the Congress and with a straight face says, the era of big government is over. Uh, I mean, it was really a pretty remarkable moment uh, and led scars on the left, which Hillary never overcame. I mean, there are a lot of liberals who hated what the Clintons did. Um, and then we, we, again, sort of had a period of being in the doldrums and uh, following some policies that frankly didn't work. I mean, look, I, I was for the war in Iraq. Uh, and I certainly was for the war in Afghanistan. But you have to look 17 years later and say, you know, we haven't figured out how to win these things. And, and along comes Trump. And I, and I agree with you about describing Trump. And, and as you and I talked about earlier off camera, you have the Tea Party movement begin to explode around 2010 because they couldn't grow up against a Republican president, but they could rapidly mobilize against a Democratic president. And so you have a whole new wave of energy. John Boehner and the House Republicans actually won 10 more seats in 2010 than I won in, in 1994. 63 seats? 63 you seats. Got 54 seats. Yeah. And, and Boehner did it with a very straightforward, simple campaign. Where are the jobs? And it just worked. I mean, it came together. People looked up and said, that's the right you know, thing. This, you know, that's the right question. Um, 
And so we were back in charge of the House again. And I think people today have no idea how unusual this is. That we, we did not have, we held the House for two two-year terms between 1930 and 1994. So out of 64 years, we held the House for four years. We've now held the House a vast majority of the time since 1994. And um, along comes Trump, and, and I agree with you. I, I tell people, I'm not sure he's a conservative, but he's the most effective anti-liberal in my lifetime. And whether it's deregulation or conservative judges or cutting taxes or standing up for an American foreign policy based on American values, every time you turn around, he is instinctively saying things which drive the left crazy. And he's doing it, I think, because of this notion of common sense and the things he learned a long time ago. Again, he's old enough. He remembers the values of the post-World War II, highly patriotic America, where People, you know, loved the flag and they loved the idea that we were the greatest nation on earth and they loved the values of the, of the Declaration of Independence and the, and the Constitution. And so in a lot of ways, he's carrying forward, almost as a grandfather, the values of two generations ago and taking head on the, the left-wing radical values which the academic world, the news media and Hollywood uh, have tried to impose on the country. And yet it seems to me, Newt, that he wasn't always this way. It wasn't always coming toward a conservative conclusion. You know, he had a background as a Democrat, as a Reform Party supporter. He backed some liberals. And I think, as he's been president, that these things have crystallized for him. That sitting there, you know, where the buck stops there, and seeing these policies, seeing the impact of these policies, or potential impact of the left's policies, using his common sense and using his business background and so forth, and he's an incredibly intelligent man, and he's sitting there and saying, no, that's not right. And when you really think these things through, he comes, and many people come to a more conservative perspective. I think that's partly true. I, I think the Donald Trump between 1983 or 4, uh, and, and as early as the 80s, uh, Oprah Winfrey's asking him if he's going to run for president. He's a very young guy at that point. That Donald Trump, I think, was stunningly shallow. And, and was sort of for whatever we're for, because, you know, that's what we're doing. And gradually began to change. And I think that it is watching Obama that drove him to the right. Because it was just clear, to, I mean, in a sense, Bush and the failure to win in Iraq and Afghanistan drove him into a, a, a harsh critique of American foreign policy. And Obama's entire approach to policy drove Trump to just say, this is crazy. I remember years ago, I had the opportunity to spend time uh, with uh, the founder of, of uh, uh, Singapore, who had been uh, the great leader who created a remarkably successful country. And I asked him, what was the base of what he did? And he said, well, you know, I was a graduate student in Britain during the Labour government right after World War II. And every time I would encounter a problem, I'd ask myself, what would Clement Attlee and the socialists do? And I would do the exact opposite. And it worked every time. And I think, in a sense, Trump came out of the, the Obama years, having been driven to a much more practical businessman, common sense approach. And because he wanted to run as a Republican, uh, he began to acquire allies like Dave Bossie and others who were naturally in the conservative movement. Sean Hannity is probably, in some ways, uh, ironically, his closest advisor in that period. Uh, I mean, you can't do the Hannity show once or twice a week and not gradually become a conservative because it just doesn't work. And then I remember we were, Clist and I were in the meeting uh, here in Washington, his first visit to Washington as a candidate, where we're sitting around and people, your point, I mean, people kind of going, is this guy a total opportunist? Why would I believe him? And somebody in the group came up and said, why don't we put together a list of 10 solid conservatives that you would name to the Supreme Court? so that people can realize here's, here's stability, here's a clear commitment, it's a yes or no. And, and Leonard Leo uh, and Jim DeMint of the Heritage Foundation agreed to take the lead, and Leonard Leo, who's the head of the Federalist Society. And that's one of the big changes, I think, because we now have relationships that we didn't have 30 years ago. I mean, we, we, you couldn't have produced the number of judges for Reagan that, that they're now producing for Trump. And this came, by the way, out of the Reagan administration. 
sort of the farm team right. became the team. Federalist Society, the Heritage Foundation, many of the people who are being pointed to the bench worked at the Justice Department, right. or worked in the U.S. Attorney's offices under Reagan, under Meese, and they developed this whole farm team. That's exactly right. Yeah. And so Trump, because he was running as a Republican, and because he, he, he has no hostility to conservatism, it's just he doesn't think about it much. And he has enormous hostility to political correctness and liberalism because it just doesn't fit how he thinks the world works. Uh, and so I think we ended up with somebody who I, I compare, frankly, to Andrew Jackson as one of the most disruptive presidents we've ever had because, because he's not afraid to take on the establishment every single morning. And we need a disruptive president, don't we? Absolutely. Uh, we, it would have been, I think if we had had a, a Reaganite follow Reagan in 88, we might have, been, in fact, gotten to where we are today a generation earlier. Uh, but it was very hard to break out of the establishment. That's why you have the Never Trump movement, because these are people who are just paralyzed at the idea that, that, that their little world is disintegrating and that this brand new populist conservative world is overwhelming them. And because he is a disruptor, in a positive sense, the people who don't like being disrupted, you talk about the never Trumpers, are really the Trump haters. Right. Not just within the Republican Party, the entire Democrat establishment, including the media establishment, including academia, almost to a man and woman, they are lined up, you know, attacking this president because he's a disruptor, correct? Yeah, and I, I, I actually think there's a profound historic reason for that. I think at 8 o'clock on election night, all of those people had a bottle of champagne chilling. They were all going to celebrate breaking the glass ceiling with Hillary. They were going to get radicals appointed to the Supreme Court. And life was good. Two hours later, it's clear that Hillary's going to lose. And if Hillary's going to lose, that means, oh my God, Donald J. Trump's going to be president. So this two hours is the equivalent psychologically of an IED going off. And they get, they get basically the equivalent of PTSD. I mean, these people are all in a state of shock. They try to recover, and this is part of Trump's genius. Every morning they wake up and they think this could be a better day, and then he's already, he's already tweeted six times before they get awake, and they go, oh, my God, he's still president. And they go right back into the PTSD. And so what you've had is a, a collective psychotic experience by the entire left. We would then get together in sort of therapy support groups called fundraisers and cocktail parties and what have you, and they all talk to each other, and they get hysterical. Uh, and so, I mean, Max uh, Boot, who's a good historian, wrote at one point he'd rather vote for Joseph Stalin than for Donald Trump. Now, that is an insane comment. I mean, Stalin killed well over 30 million people, but it was just that sense of the mood and, you know, trying to express how deeply he felt. When we come back, I'm going to ask you what all of this has to do with the upcoming midterm elections and how you, you compare this to other midterm elections. Is it as important and consequential as so many people have said, or is it just another election? Ladies and gentlemen, don't forget to watch us on Levin TV almost every weeknight. Just sign up at crtv.com slash mark, crtv.com slash mark, or give us a call, 844-LEVIN-TV, 844-LEVIN-TV.